December 22, 1964, Palmdale, California. The sun hasn't even broken the horizon yet, and test pilot Bob Gilliland is staring at something that shouldn't exist. It's sitting there on the tarmac like a predator from another world old sharp angles, black titanium skin, and a design so radical that even the engineers who built it aren't entirely sure it lines fly. This is the SR-71 Blackbird, and in less than an hour, Bob Gilliland is going to climb into the cockpit and attempt something no human being has ever done before. If the engines don't explode, if the aircraft doesn't disintegrate at speed, if any one of a thousand things doesn't go catastrophically wrong, Bob's hands are steady, his heart rate surprisingly calm. Because this is what he was born to do, but here's the thing Bob Gilliland wasn't some hotshot fighter jock looking for glory. He was an engineer who happened to be an exceptional pilot and that combination. That is exactly what made him the only person on Earth qualified to fly the most dangerous aircraft ever created. This is the story of the man who tamed the Blackbird. And trust me, it's nothing like you think. Let's rewind. Because Bob Gilliland did not start his life dreaming about breaking speed records or flying at the edge of space. He grew up in Memphis, Tennessee during the Great Depression. His family didn't have money for flying lessons or fancy aviation dreams. But Bob had something better an engineer's mind trapped in a kid's body and an obsession with understanding how things worked. While other kids were playing baseball, Bob was taking apart radios, building model airplanes, not just assembling them, actually understanding the aerodynamics, the weight distribution, the control surfaces. His teachers thought he was quiet, reserved. What they didn't realize was that Bob's mind was constantly running calculations, solving problems, seeing the world as a series of engineering challenges waiting to be cracked. When World War II broke out, Bob was too young to enlist. But he watched the war from home, studied every aircraft that flew overhead, memorized their specifications, and he made himself a promise. One day, he'd fly. He enrolled at the University of Washington, studied aeronautical engineering. But here's where Bob's story gets interesting. He didn't just want to design aircraft. He wanted to test them, to understand not just the theory, but the reality. The feel of the stick in your hand, the g-forces pressing against your chest, the split-second decisions that separate a successful flight from a smoking crater. So he did something almost unheard of, he became both engineer and test pilot. After graduating, Bob joined the Navy, earned his wings, and quickly proved he wasn't just competent, he was exceptional. Calm under pressure, analytical in crisis, the kind of pilot who could feel when something was wrong with an aircraft before the instruments showed it. But the Navy wasn't where Bob's real story would unfold. That would happen at a classified facility in the California desert, working for a company called Lockheed. More specifically, for a legendary engineer named Kelly Johnson and his secretive division known as the Skunk Works. The Cold War is at its peak and the United States has a problem, Soviet air defenses are getting to good. The Utah spy plane which had been flying reconnaissance missions over the Soviet Union for years is becoming vulnerable. The CIA needs something new, something faster. Something that can fly so high and so fast that even if the Soviets see it coming, they can't do a damn thing about it. Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works team are given an impossible mission, design an aircraft that can fly at Mach 3 three times the speed of sound at altitudes above 80,000 feet for extended periods without falling apart. To understand how insane this challenge was, you need to know what happens to an aircraft at Mach 3. The air friction creates surface temperatures exceeding 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Conventional aluminum melts, the fuselage expands and contracts. The fuel heats up to the point where it could explode. And oh, by the way, you need engines powerful enough to push through that heat, wings that can handle the stress, and a pilot who won't pass out from the physical demands. Most engineers would have said it's impossible. Kelly Johnson said, give me two years, the result was unlike anything that had ever flown. 
The SR-71 wasn't built, it was sculpted. Every angle, every curve, every panel was designed to minimize radar signature and maximize performance. The entire aircraft was made of titanium, sourced secretly from the Soviet Union through shell companies because the U.S. didn't have enough. The irony, the Soviets unknowingly provided the material for the very aircraft that would spy on them. But building the Blackbird was only half the battle, someone had to fly it. And that's where Bob Gilliland enters the story. Lockheed needed a test pilot with an engineer's brain. Someone who could not only fly the aircraft but provide detailed technical feedback, who could troubleshoot problems in real time at 80,000 feet, who could stay cool when everything went to hell. The list of qualified candidates was short. Actually, it was one name long, Bob Gilliland. When Lockheed approached him in 1962, Bob was already a respected test pilot. He'd flown dozens of experimental aircraft, including the U-2, but the SR-71. That was different. That was stepping into the unknown. And Bob knew it. He studied every blueprint. Every engineering specification, he sat with Kelly Johnson and the design team for months, not just learning how to fly the aircraft, but understanding WH why it was built the way it was. Bob wasn't just going to be a pilot, he was going to be a partner in the aircraft as development. And on December 22, 1964, it was time to find out if it would actually work. Imagine this moment, you're standing on the tarmac at Palmdale. The desert air is cold and still, and in front of you is an aircraft that looks like it came from 50 years in the future. Black as midnight, sleek as a dagger, so classified that even the people building it don't have full clearance. Bob Gilliland walks toward the SR-71 with his flight suit on, helmet in hand. There are no crowds, no press, no fanfare. Just a small group of engineers, a few Lockheed executives, and Kelly Johnson, chain-smoking in the background, watching. Bob climbs the ladder, settles into the cockpit. The SR-71 is cramped. It wasn't designed for comfort. It was designed to go fast. The instrument panel looks like something out of a science fiction movie. Bob runs through the pre-flight checklist, his hands moving with practiced precision, engine start. The twin Pratt and Whitney J-58 engines roar to life a sound unlike anything else. Not a whine, not a rumble. A deep, guttural howl that shakes the ground. Bob radios the tower. Pondale Tower, SR-71, Article 2001. Ready for taxi. He eases the throttle forward. The Blackbird rolls toward the runway. Even on the ground, it feels alive, responsive, aggressive, now here's the thing about test flights that most people don't understand this isn't a joy ride. This is controlled experimentation. Bob's job isn't to see how fast he can go or how high he can climb. His job is to gather data, test systems, push boundaries carefully, incrementally, scientifically. But even with all that careful planning, the first flight of an experimental aircraft is inherently dangerous. Things can go wrong, systems can fail, and at Mach 3, when things go wrong, they go wrong fast, Bob lines up on the runway, takes a breath, and pushes the throttles forward. The SR-71 leaps off the ground, the acceleration is violent, primal. Bob feels the G-forces pressing him back into his seat as the Blackbird climbs at an angle that would make most aircraft stall. But the SR-71 isn't most aircraft. Altitude, 10,000 feet. 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet. The sky outside the canopy shifts from blue to deep purple to black. Bob is climbing toward the edge of space. Everything is reading normal. The engines are performing. The flight controls are responsive. Bob allows himself a brief moment of satisfaction this thing actually flies. But then something happens, at around 35,000 feet, Bob notices a vibration. Subtle at first, then increasing. The stick in his hand starts to oscillate. This is bad. This could be the beginning of a structural failure, a flutter that could tear the aircraft apart. Bob's voice on the radio is calm, almost casual. Pondale Tower, 
experiencing some oscillation. Reducing speed to investigate, back on the ground, Kelly Johnson's heart is in his throat. The engineers are frozen, watching telemetry data flood in. Is this it? Is the Blackbird going to come apart on its very first flight? But Bob isn't panicking. He's thinking. He reduces throttle. Tests the control surfaces. Tries different configurations. And then the vibration stops. It was a resonance frequency issue, something that could be corrected with minor adjustments. But in that moment, Bob demonstrated exactly why he was chosen. Not because he was fearless, but because he was smart, because he could think through a crisis, make rational decisions under pressure, and bring the aircraft home safely. The rest of the flight is textbook. Bob puts the Blackbird through a series of maneuvers, tests systems, gathers data. And then, after 57 minutes in the air, he brings the SR-71 back to Pondale and lands it smoothly on the runway. When Bob climbs out of the cockpit, Kelly Johnson is waiting. The legendary engineer known for being gruff, demanding, and almost impossible to please walks up to Bob, extends his hand, and says something he rarely said to anyone, Good job, Bob, that first flight. It was just the beginning. Over the next year, Bob Gilliland flew the SR-71 more than anyone else. He pushed it faster, higher, harder. He tested every system, every limitation, every edge case. And he discovered something remarkable. The Blackbird wasn't just an aircraft. It was a living, breathing machine that demanded respect. At Mach 3, the SR-71 would heat up so much that the titanium fuselage would expand by nearly a foot. The fuel tanks were designed to leak on the ground because they de only seal properly when the metal expanded at temperature. Bob would take off with fuel literally dripping from the aircraft, knowing that once he got up to speed, the leaks would stop. Flying the Blackbird wasn't like flying other planes. It required a different kind of thinking. At 80,000 feet, you're above 85% of the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is black, you can see the curvature of the Earth. And if something goes wrong, there's no margin for error. Ejection at that altitude and speed, survivable but barely. Bob flew missions that pushed the SR-71 to its absolute limits. And every time, he came back with data, insights, and suggestions for improvements. He wasn't just flying the aircraft, he was developing it. But here's something most people don't know about Bob Gilliland. He never sought the spotlight. While other test pilots were giving interviews and becoming celebrities, Bob stayed in the background. He didn't fly for fame. He flew because the work mattered, because every flight made the Blackbird better, safer, more capable. Over his career, Bob would fly the SR-71 more than any other pilot over 100 missions. He trained the operational pilots who would fly reconnaissance missions during the Cold War. He set speed and altitude records. And through it all, he remained humble, focused, and deeply committed to the mission. The SR-71 Blackbird flew operational missions from 1966 until 1998, 32 years. And in all that time, despite being shot at over 4,000 times, not a single Blackbird was ever shot down. When missiles were launched, the pilots would simply accelerate, outrun them. Because at Mach 3.2, nothing could catch the Blackbird. Bob Gilliland retired from test flying in 1978, but his connection to the Blackbird never ended. He became an advocate for aviation, a mentor to younger pilots, and a living link to one of the most incredible engineering achievements in human history. When people asked Bob what it was like to fly the SR-71, he'd often say something unexpected. He didn't talk about the speed or the altitude or the adrenaline. He talked about the view, about seeing the Earth from the edge of space, the thin blue line of atmosphere, the vastness of it all. He talked about feeling small and significant at the same time. Bob Gilliland passed away in 2019 at the age of 93. The aviation world mourned the loss of a legend. But his legacy, that lives on every time someone looks at an SR-71 in a museum and marvels at what human ingenuity can achieve. Here's the thing about Bob Gilliland that I want you to remember. 
He wasn't a cowboy. He wasn't a daredevil. He was an engineer who could fly. A thinker who happened to be exceptional with a stick in his hand. And that's exactly why he was perfect for the Blackbird. The SR-71 didn't need a pilot who would push it recklessly. It needed someone who would understand it, respect it, and work with it to unlock its full potential. Bob did that. For over a decade, he was the bridge between engineering dreams and operational reality. December 22, 1964, that first flight lasted 57 minutes. But it's impact that's still being felt today. Every time we push the boundaries of what's possible, every time we dare to build something that seems impossible, every time we look at a challenge and say, yeah, we can do that, Bob Gilliland showed us what's possible when you combine brilliance, bravery, and a quiet, uncheckable dedication to the mission. The Blackbird was the fastest aircraft ever built, but Bob Gilliland, he was something even rarer, the perfect pilot for the perfect machine. And that first flight, that was the day the impossible became real. If you enjoyed this story, hit that like button and subscribe for more incredible tales from aviation history. Drop a comment below what other legendary test pilots should we cover. And if you want to support the channel, check out the links in the description. Thanks for watching. And remember the sky is never the limit when you've got the right person at the controls. Fly safe. Fly smart and never stop pushing boundaries.